Welcome to Altium Live. And um, welcome to University Day. This is something, this is the second year that we've done this. And I can tell you that it's a, it's a growing, um, uh, growing part of our, our, our um, what we're offering. My, my name is John Watson. Uh, I'm the senior PCB engineer at LeGrand Corporation up here, just up the road here in Carlsbad, California. Um, I am not an Altium employee, you know, although the shirt says this. Uh, I had these two goons show up at my door this morning, threw the shirt on me, you know, and got me all set up. So, um, but I am a PCB engineer, just um, probably just like yourself. So I am in the trenches with you guys, with dealing with all the struggles and the, all the situations that we have as, as PCB designers. And how many of you, a couple administrative things here. Number one, um, how many have never attended Altium Live before? This is your first. Wow. That is phenomenal. How many have attended past Altium Lives? Okay, great. So you've seen me around. I've been a part of this since it began. Uh, it's a phenomenal thing. Now, I tell you, three years ago, many of you who have worked with Altium know that we did a switch from Altium 17 over to 18. That was a big jump for, for Altium to do. Um, basically, they jumped from a 32-bit uh, platform up to the 64-bit platform. And that was the very first year they offered Altium Live. And I thought, oh, here it comes. At that time, it was two days. It was going to be a two-day commercial on the new software and all this and that. Boy, was I wrong. I was absolutely wrong on that. Um, it wasn't about Altium. You're going to see a little bit in the next few days regarding Altium, OK? And then Altium 20, new features, different things like that. But that's not the focus. The focus is you. The focus is you as a designer and helping you as a designer and to be able to offer to you classes, training, uh, intermingling with each other and to be able to grow in the next three days as a designer. It's not about Altium. I, I, I want to set that as the forefront right now. It's not about Altium, it's about you. And we are here because of you and for you for the next few days. So my name is John Watson. As I said, I am in the trenches just like you are. And uh, this is a, we're the very first session uh, today is going to be getting started in Altium Pro, Altium, Altium Concord Pro. How many of you have Concord Pro now? Okay. Kind of hands like, uh, maybe, maybe I have it, maybe I... How many of you have it installed in a system somewhere on your, in your server? <laughs> okay, there they are. All right, how many of you are actually using it? <laughs> Not very many. Yeah. That's why, we're here. <laughs> that's why you're here. And that's good, because I can tell you by the end of today, all right, we're gonna, I'm going to be in this room all day long teaching. All right, and we have, by the end of today, you're going to be able to set up your components, your libraries, your projects, everything else. Everything's going to be organized that you can leave here and you can hit the ground running when you get back to your companies. And you can actually go up to your manager and you can say, well, you know, boss, that money that you spent on the Concord Pro, hey, we got it now. We're good. All right, so I've already met a few people that, um, have said, you know, it's been there for a year. Um, yeah, my Concord Pro has been there for since we they released it, and then we haven't done anything with it. I said, you got it. you got to be here, all right. This is the 2020 Corvette. Now, bringing up vehicles, I, I just heard a news article. I just heard a news report yesterday from Tesla. Now I try to stay up with tech tech news. You know, I'm a techie. All right. And I'm going to really put the cameraman to work today because I, I, I can't stand still, OK? Believe it or not, I haven't even had my coffee yet. And I'm, I'm OK? <laughs> 
Well, Tesla put out the news yesterday that they're now going to put in the new features in their vehicles. And one of the, I guess, have, have you heard the new, the new feature of Tesla about being able to summon your car? That's pretty cool. You know, I'm just kind of wondering what happens at the stadium when everyone leaves and is standing at the door summoning their car. You know, that's going to be interesting. But a new feature that Tesla is going to be putting out is that you're actually going to be able to customize your horn. I thought, well, that, that could be interesting, you know? You know, driving in LA, someone cuts you off. How many of you guys are from Southern California? All right, so you know what I'm talking about, right? You're driving and someone cuts you off and then I've programmed my horn to be a goat. So it was like, cut me off and you ran me against the wall. It's like, nyeh, nyeh, nyeh. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so every, all the Ultium people are gonna be, what is he doing in there, <laughs> all right? <laughs> so it's gonna be interesting, but these are the new things. Uh, but this here is the 2020 Corvette C8 Stingray. How many of you have seen this? You, they're not for sale yet. They're coming out like in a few months, all right? But this is the Corvette, the new Corvette. They moved the engine. I'm going to get real geeky on you. They moved the engine to what's called the mid-level back here behind the, the driver now. It's not up in front, OK? But this is a beautiful car, all right? It has 6.2 liter V8, 500 horsepower, 470 pounds of torque at 5,150 RPMs, all right? This is cool. Yeah, but the big, the big news is that you're now going to be able to go from zero to 60 mile per hour, 100 kilometers in three seconds. Eight gears. You've got to work through eight gears to get there. All right. Now, what they say is the first five gears are for like track, you know, shifting, downshifting, yeah doing all that, and then the top gear are for cruising. Yeah. So can you imagine that? You're in first gear and you just push that pedal and you know, and you're off, all right? And you're shifting gears, you know? But what happens if you never shifted out of first gear? What happens? You don't go anywhere. And you're stuck in traffic. But what happens if we never shift out of gears, first gear? And I have seen so many designers. I've been, in, I've been a designer for 20 years. I've been in PCB design for 20 years, mostly with Altium, usually back when it was Protel. If you guys remember that. And uh, before that was DOS programs. Love those. Those were great, right? Before that was tape and mylar. Well, what happened if we as an industry have never shifted out of our first gear? We would still be, we'd all be sitting in a black room with a, on a light table, right? With tape and mylar. Guys, anyone do tape and mylar? Huh? They have? peeling it off with an X-Acto knife, you go home, you have all these little black spots of tape all over you, right? But we as an industry, we have to shift gears. We have to. And we as designers have to shift gears. What worked yesterday is not going to be working today. Our industry is fast moving. The industry demands for us to shift the gears. We have to. But this, it's not just for us as designers that we have to shift gears, but also we, as in our tools, we have to shift gears. In our tools, I've seen people use Altium, and they, they basically are using it still in first gear, and they never shift out of it. I had a guy that was doing, I, I came up and he was, we just a new designer, so I was kind of watching him and, you know, he came up and he was doing length tuning. 
And he did the, he pulled out his an Excel spreadsheet that he had created, and he was so proud of it. And he said, look, I can do length tuning. And he put in his numbers, you know, of what his total length was, and then how many, you know, miters, and high, you know, the height and the frequency, and all this and that. And then he was in there drawing these by hand, of copying, you know, one cycle of a, a length tune of a, of a, and he would just copy and paste it until he, had, he was pretty close. And then he would, I said, you know what? Ultim has a feature for that. You see, he, had sh he, was, he was stuck in first gear. He was stuck there. He didn't know that there was a second and third and fourth gear. So in the offset of this week, I can tell you that when you leave here, you're not going to be the same designer that you are right now. I can guarantee it. And I can tell, because you're here now and not tomorrow, that you're serious about this. You're the serious ones. Because you're not going to be, because you're not here tomorrow, you're here today to learn. And that is an exciting part about all this. So in the mindset, Start thinking about shifting your gears, shift the gears, shift the gears. Keep that in mind throughout this entire week. Shift the gears. I got to get out of my, I got to get out of my first gear. I got to get out of my second gear. I, whatever gear you are in, shift the gears. Our industry demands it. Okay? 1965, the Goodard Space Flight Center in Maryland was in charge of the first manned flight into space. 1965, and this beautiful piece of machinery, the state-of-the-art computer that they had brought in to the Goodard uh, Center was the IBM System 360 model 75S computer. Isn't it beautiful? Isn't it gorgeous? Isn't that lovely? The thing basically was, a, it, at that time, was a cutting-edge technology, okay? It was top of the line. 512 bytes of core memory. I should, I, I'm sorry, we're going to redo that. We have to basically get the ambience in this class correct right now. So basically, you can have this right now. Take it home, uh, the cutting edge technology at 512 gigabytes of core memory at a beautiful price right now, just for you, $3.5 million. It was basically the size of a car, all right? This thing was huge, but it was the cutting age in 1965. 52 years later, it's November 17th, 2017, this is a, even, a, even recent. This is even, even the most recent stuff I've got. You have the iPhone 10. It's a beautiful piece of equipment. It's got a, a case of 5.65 inches by 2.79, 64-bit ARM, an eight, a six-core CPU, uses 4.3 billion transistors. The neural engine in the iPhone 10 does 600 billion operations per second, and three gigabyte of RAM with an additional storage of 256, 256 gigabyte of RAM. That is where we're headed. You hold, on your, you hold in your hand more power, 100 times fold more power than was in the first computer that put a man on the moon. Think about that. But this brings up the question, what advancements will we see in the next 50 years? Gee whiz, what are we going to see in the next 10 years? What, five years? We're seeing some amazing things. What tools will we use to get there? And most importantly, who's going to lead this great new advancements? Who's going to be the designers who are going to put this all together? You know, I, I, I love designers. I'm a PCB designer myself. I do a lot of teaching, writing. How many of you guys have read anything I've written? Thank you. You're the one. Thank you. You're the one. 
Um, no, it's, it, we have a lot of material, so check it out. I'm not going to, it's not about, about the blogs. Um, but we have some amazing advancements coming up. I particularly like this one up here, the Delft Hyperloop. I'm working with the Delft Hyperloop team and working with them in their development of the, the Hyperloop vehicle. How many of you are familiar with the Hyperloop? Vacuum tube system, seven, six, 700 miles. They're pushing to, to go from six to 700 miles per hour. Can actually go faster than a plane on land. But we're, we're going to see some amazing things that are popping up and new technologies. Um, some of these are, are just taking off right now. Some of these new technologies are absolutely unbelievable. So what is... What, one of the tools that we're going to need is a thing called Concord Pro. I'm sorry, that, I, that didn't come out right. Let, let, me, let me redo that. That, that wasn't it's not the way I wanted to present that. Let me, let me I can do better. Let me, let me check something here. Uh, let me see. Mm. Let's see. Hmm, that's better. Gotta get the ambience right. Can you see the other? Presenting to you, Concord Pro. <laughs> okay, so, so some things work, some things don't. Um, I, uh, I'm an old vault guy. Um, how many of you guys have worked with the vault? Okay. Very similar. Very, very similar. So don't feel as if you're out of the ballpark here. So the official f thing is that Concord Pro is a single source for component data, real-time sourcing information, component traceability within designs, collaboration with the mechanical design, team all within the Ultium Designer unifi Unified Environment. This is your tool that, that you have available. So in Ultium, if I can learn how to use this, dang, 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 there it is. Uh, you have up-to-date component data, which we're going to be covering in, in, in uh, the second session today. We then also have ECAD, MCAD collaboration. Um, just a point here. Um, all these slides are being video recorded and all the slides are going to be offered to you uh, after the class. So don't feel as if you've got to get write everything down regarding these, okay? You then also have component traceability where used, which has become a really important part of the whole uh, project or what you're doing is not, if you make a change on a design, where does that impact? What does that impact? Then also you have real-time sourcing information. Um, I'm sure that if you've been in the industry any period of time now that you've realized that we are in the, we're coming out of a component shortage issue. Component shortages are still an issue and you have with uh, Concord Pro a real-time sourcing that you can pull up with information on a component. A lot of components are being obsoleted then for things like that. So it's important to stay on top of that sourcing information. So the main part of Concord Pro is about components. All right? Maybe I'm jumping the gun here with com component sourcing. Mm -hmm. Can you actually interact with the manufacturers if you don't need distribution at all? Yes. You can use the, the setup with based on the manufacturer. We're going to have about 20 minutes at the end for questions. So what I want is like, if you could write your questions down. Um, I'm of the age now that I actually have to write everything down, otherwise I forget it. Like three minutes later, I'm thinking, now what was that, you know? Um, but go ahead and we'll have a big uh, conversation at the end regarding any of your questions. So the main part of Concord Pro is the component library, but I want you to realize there's a lot more to it, okay? There's also, there's, well, let me go back. 
I gotta get ready for this one. This is, this is one of those tough slides that you gotta really kind of practice at. In Concord Pro, there is PCB project design, PCB assembly of data, PCB fabrication data, binary files, 3D models, there's simulation models, managed schematics, later stacks, schematic templates, there's BOM templates, output job files, script design pro preferences, and there's project catalog, wrap template, component templates, and project templates. <sighs> there we go. There's more than just components. Don't get locked into just components in Concord Pro, okay? There's a lot more into this, and as we go through today, you're gonna see this involves your components, your projects, your templates, your everything that you would need on a project is right here, okay? So, but wait, there is more. There's ECAD to MCAD collaboration, and there's also P Concord to PLM connections that can be made to uh, Arena, Agile, and Windchill. How many of you use e one of those three? Okay, are you using Concord Pro as a PLM connection between them? All right, you need to, this is why you're here. This is why you're here. We're shifting gears, guys, we're shifting gears. We're getting out of our first gears and it, moving on, all right? We got, we got, we're, so basically Concord Pro, it's your Corvette. It's your 2020 Corvette. And we need to basically, we need to get ready to go from zero to 60 in three seconds because we are going from zero to 60 in three seconds. You're gonna see some amazing things this week. You're gonna be talking to amazing people. I find that you guys are some of the most amazing people to talk to. And, and, watch, and watch for this. It, it's an amazing thing to watch. Tonight, throughout the day, the computers start popping out and does Altium comes up and people are gathered around the fireplace downstairs or wherever, and they're, they're going through designs. They're talking about designing. And that's a great part about all this. I, I'm, in, I'm with my friends here. That's, what, that's the way I look at it. And we, we are just going to be a lot of collaboration, a lot of talking together to this week and about the thing that we all love. PCB design. I love PCB design. I still, this, it's the, the heart and soul of what I enjoy. Sitting down with a design and, and solving it. So number, library management 101. Is this straight? So sit, there's a big fancy word that people love throwing around in uh, mostly like little meetings and, um, uh, you know, especially meetings when the presidents or vice presidents or management's there, they love throwing around the word, you know, sir, <clears throat> you know, what we need here is more synergy. And it's one of those words that they just kind of throw out, you know, as saying, you know, look, I, I'm on top of things here. But really what synergy is, is the interaction or the cooperation of two or more organizations, substances or other agents to produce a combined effect greater than the sum of their separate parts. That is a great description of a PCB library. What are we doing when we're talking about PCB libraries? We're taking all these little individual parts and pieces and we're putting them on a board and we're coming out the other side with amazing things. These little, has anyone seen a 201 capacitor recently? <laughs> a thousand five capacitor? <laughs> yeah. If you got these sitting on your desk, they look like pieces of dust. All right, really, really. They, they just look like pieces of little dust on your desk and you're thinking that's an electronic component. How do they do this? But 
really, that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about synergy. We're talking about creating an amazing things out of, of individual pieces, and we're, the sum of it is greater than what we started with. And I can tell you that the engineers are great. Double E's, how many double E's do we have here? All right, oh boy. I apologize beforehand, okay? I, uh, the double E's are great. You guys have a, a phenomenal role that you play. But you know what? Putting it on paper is good. That's, a good, that's the starting point. But we as, P, as PCB designers, we have to take that and make it real. We have to take those, those ideas and thoughts that the engineer put down there and create a PCB design, uh, a design out of it. That's why I say the PCB designers, you guys, you're the builder of the dream. The e double E's, they sit and they dream this up. Our job is to make it a reality that where you lay out the board, get it out there, bring it back, have it sitting there. I, I, I find that amazing every time I, I see it, is that it, all these lines that were on your computer days before is now sitting on your desk as a finished board. That's amazing to me. I just, I still am amazed. And we are the builder. And our hope is, is that you have that board done and it actually works. A PCB's design process is, is, a, is a sequence of events. Understand this. A PCB process begins at a, pro, at a point at the very beginning where one or more resource employees, time, energy, machines, convert those inputs, that data, the materials, into outputs. And then these outputs then serve as inputs for the next stage. OK? There it is. So understand that. We have stages in our PCB process, right? And we start over here with our library. Everything starts with the library. Everything starts with that single component and that single piece that you have. And then it goes into the next stage and the next stage. You have your input and you have an output of that stage. It's very important to understand that you should be looking at each of those stages as saying, OK, what are my inputs and what are my outputs? That then becomes the input for the next stage. I've heard it said so many times that, you know, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. My dad used to tell me that. It's not how you start, son, it's how you finish. Well, that works well with sports if you're in halftime and you can make up the second half, right? But in PCB design, you've got to start off on the right foot. You really do. You need to have the right data input here. Otherwise, your pipeline is already messed up. You're, you're messed up. You're going, to be, you're going to be using information that is not verified and that you, you haven't quite qualified yet to be in a design. So it said that it's not how you start, but how you finish. It's hard to recover if you get off on the wrong foot. Garbage in, garbage out mentality, OK? So what I'm going to be introducing to you today is what's called the SMART rule. How many of you have, have seen anything regarding the SMART rule of PCB design, or of the library management? No one? OK, good. And that's the way we can learn it today. All right, smart, the SMART rule. Every one of your libraries, I can tell you, is different. OK, every one of them. Every, every person's library is different in this company, right? Can we agree to that? And you, one person's library is not going to be the same as the next. But there are five rules that you need to have for every single library. No matter what, or no matter what structure or what information you have there, these five rules have got to be in place for you to, for your library to be a to work and to be effective, okay? 
Let me check my time here. <clears throat> so those five rules are this. And I, I made it simple to say smart so you can remember it. Um, why did I use the pillars? I, I use pillars because these five rules are going to be giving support for everything above it. This is your foundation, like for your house. And everything else then is built on that. Your components then are built on top of these pillars, and then your, your pro PCB projects are built on those components. And that's the way you need to look at the structure of, of this whole setup. Number two is removing one pillar will weaken the others. You can't say, well, you know, I like that, this, and this, but I don't like that. All right, you need all five of these for your systems to work correctly. And lastly, only a, this is only an example of how it can work, guys. I, I want to put that in the forefront. This is not a set rule or how you have to do it. This is how we did it at Legrand. All right, I'm going to be sharing a lot about our information and the experiences that we went through at Legrand. Uh, how many are familiar with the Legrand Corporation? All right, there you go. A couple more. Thank you. Um, probably if you go to like Holmes or uh, Lowe's, you'll see a lot of Legrand products. We have a lot of um, uh, divisions and different things around the world. But um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about how we structured ours, but that's not a set rule. You've got to take this and kind of adjust it for your situation, okay? Take it and adjust it. I, I kind of look at, I kind of relate everything back to, everything in my life, guys, back to food, food in some way. I, I want you to look at this like a buffet, a beautiful buffet, all right? And just, you say, well, I like this, I like this, and this, well, I don't like this. I, you know. take, a take, go through the buffet and take what you can and plug it into your situation and try to use it, okay? So the number, the number one rule is this, singularity. The S stands for singularity. M is managed. M, A is your architecture. A, uh, R is your reproduci reproducibility or reviewing. This is a couple changes I'm making on, on these last two and traceability or tailoring your information. So let's, let's go through these in more detail now. So singularity, you, can, you have got to work from a single library. You cannot work from a multi, I, I got you laughing there. What, what, you you experienced this, have you? Nightmare. It's a nightmare. There he is. I got, I got a witness right there. I got a witness. All right. It's a nightmare. It's an absolute nightmare. Okay. Our objective as PCB designers is to produce the highest quality of designs possible. Right. We do not want to put out junk unless you want to put out junk, but don't, don't expect to keep your job very long. All right. And believe me, I've been there where I've had to make the long walk to the manager's office because we just got a fabric, we just got a call from an assembly house. All right. And they said, well, I'm sorry, but we can't build your boards as you designed them because there's the wrong footprint on the board. Uh, I'm sorry, we can't do anything about it. And we did, you know, Wow, we just wasted $50,000 on a fabrication, okay? And I've got to go into the manager's office now and explain that to them, okay? I've been there. And that's a long walk. That's a long, long walk you've got to make and to explain that we screwed up. And because we screwed up, what, what happened? We wasted money, okay? You look at it as... We look at it one way. I'll tell you what, management looks at it and says you wasted money. That's what they, they see it. To produce the highest quality design possible, we have got to have consistency. And I'll tell you, your boards are going to fall into three categories. 
and I, I love old movies, all right? And some of you will get this, some of you won't. Some of the younger folks are fine. They're going to say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly was a movie with Clint Eastwood. Great movie. Love this movie. But it's, it's true. Your boards are going to fall into those three categories. You're going, to either be, you're going to either be the good, the bad, or the ugly. Okay? Your boards will fall into one of those three categories. And depending how far off they are to being good is how much money that you waste. Everything that you do has got to be viewed in a way of how much money am I going to lose if it's wrong? We, did, we do that all the time. And we, we're going to be looking at how we can basically have a design, go through, have it approved, and work the first time. Right? Sound good? Nothing causes problems faster than multiple libraries. It is a nightmare. Absolute nightmare. OK? When you don't know, when you do not have a single source of truth that you work from. Have you ever noticed in the English language that when someone tells who's dishonest, what do we say? They told a lie. Okay? But when someone's honest, what do we say? We told, he said, he told the truth. Truth is singular. Truth will always be singular. There is multiple ways you can screw things up. <laughs> Believe me, I've done them. Okay? <laughs> All right? And there are, there's only one way to do it correctly. And nothing causes problems faster than having multiple sources of information from different places. Not to mention your lost profit your lost money that you put into this. How many of you guys work on a bonus system, like get, you know, based on profit? We, we do at LeGrand. And I'll tell you, I always have it in the back of my mind about, you know, if I'm gonna waste money, I'm gonna lose, I'm gonna lose my profit. I'm gonna lose my, my uh, sharing or my share on that. 1,123. It's a significant number, isn't it? When I stepped into the LeGrand four years ago, one of the first things I did was I did a search on their server of all libraries. That's the number I came up with, 1,123. And I would walked up to an engineer and he, he, he pulled me aside and he, he opened a drawer. And the drawer was like a filing cabinet drawer, one of the deep ones. He opened that drawer and under, all these were like bare PCBs. I thought, wow, you guys have been really busy. He goes, no, those were our rejects. Those are the boards that did not make it to assembly. I found out that we had such a high failure rate on our boards that we had, we had failures that we were, were well over 50% of every board we were doing was failing at different levels and stages or they had to be redone or respun or, or it was a it was an absolute nightmare and so much money that drawer represented money to this company we lost money 1123 libraries every single there were different types different sizes some had a few components some had lots of components everyone set up their own personal libraries everything Different component libraries, 1,123 different component libraries. So what did I do? Well, I'm the senior PCB engineer. I'm in charge. All right? I've been there before. Friday afternoon after everyone had left, I went on the server, and I deleted everyone's library. All 1,123 of them. Gone. Okay. 
So I purposely, the next Monday, I purposely came in late, like an hour. I told my boss, I, uh, he knew about this. It's a good thing about my boss is fully supports what I do. So I told him, I said, I'm going to be an hour late. He goes, okay, I understand. I know why. Okay. So I kind of walk in Monday morning at, at you know, 9 o'clock. I stroll in. And we have, a, we have a, a, a kind of an open cubicle environment. All right. And uh, I'll tell you, as soon as I walked in the door, you heard the whispers, he's here. He's here. He's here. <laughs> so I walked through. I said, OK, everybody in the conference room. All right. I put everyone in, all the engineers, all the PCB guys. And I said, OK. Your, your own personal libraries, they're gone. They're deleted, all right? At that point, I had an engineer crying, all right? I really did. I mean, just, he goes, well, what are we going to do? We're going to have a single library. Everybody will work from a single library. You cannot work. You cannot be effective with the 1,123 libraries, guys. Singularity is going to be key to what you do. How many of you guys have multiple libraries right now? OK. Get rid of them immediately. What? I've been trying. <laughs> OK, I'm going to show you a trick on how you can verify in the future that no rogue libraries are being used, all right? Okay. okay. All right. Um, it, it's very important because if you can't get control of that first step, forget forget the rest. Forget the rest. Okay. Concord Pro and that first pillar of of singularity, you're you're you can easily set up accessible to a local server. You can set up your library on a local service, and every everyone works from that that library. It allows for full control of who has access to the library. Also, then you have levels of various permissions that you can limit what can be done. Not everybody can do everything in my library. All right? And that's a battle I fault also. And we'll talk about that. Who can do what in my library? You've got to realize, what does that library represent? It's money. It's money to us. It's absolute money. And not to, to work from that library is a disaster. All right? So the second is managed. Our second Concord Board management plan. There is a management plan in Concord Pro that allows you to manage then your information. I don't know what's worse, working from multiple libraries or working from a single library that's not managed. I haven't quite nailed that one down yet, OK? <laughs> but there's four levels of this, four areas of, of your management plan that you can, you're, we're going to be looking at and setting up here. A revision control. You have your life cycle schemes that you can then set up. You have your roles. And then you also have your permission levels. These are your four levels that you're going to be managing your data with. So important to note. It's best to set these things up first to set up, the, set up your management plan before you really get into your library too much. It's hard to, it's difficult to change and shift gears or change this after you get too many components built up, okay? So kind of sit down, set up a plan, what the revision, what your management plan is going to be for your library, and understand how your plan is going to go forward. Now, the very, two very important things about that is this. N do not set your library up for where you're at right now. I, was at, I, was, I do consulting, and I've spoken to a lot of people. And I can tell you that I've, I've gone in and I've, I've spoken to uh, you know, VPs of engineering and talking to them. And they, they said, well, this is where we're at right now. We have, we have 2,000 components that we've got to manage. OK. And my question for them is, what's, the, what's your growth development for the next 10 years as a company? He goes, excuse me? Yeah. 
You don't, you're not going to stay at 2,000 components, are you? Or are you intending to grow as a company? Well, we're intending to grow, of course. You know, I actually went into a company for an interview one time, and I asked the, I asked the owner of the company who I was interviewing with, I said, so where do you see the company in five years? He goes, well, I basically see it where we're at right now. I don't see us growing very much. And I was gone. I, so I was out of there, man. I no. I don't want to be in a company that's not going to be growing. OK? So what the, the, my point is this, is that you have got to kind of understand where the company is going to be 10 years from now. Not where you're at now, but where you're going to be 10 years from now and be able to prepare for that. So what, we're going to, what you have to do in your library is make sure that you can adjust that. Make sure that it's flexible enough to where you can adjust your library as the company grows. And we're going to see that, OK? So in, uh, in Concord Pro, you're able to set up a revision control. Um, any, any revision control that you would want, you can set up. Now, we use a particular one at Legrand where we use a, uh, uh, a, a numeric and an alpha, a minor, a major, minor revisioning of our products. Now, understand, as you kind of go through here, your components, all right, will, will have a single revisioning level. There's no reason to have a minor on a component, for example. So as we go through, we just have a numeric on that. We, so every time that you touch that component, that revision level is going to cycle through. So you, you keep all the history on that component from very beginning. So there's no real reason for an alpha on a component um, and other, other items too. We're going to see that. But let's say on a project though, on a PCB project, oh yeah, an alpha would be very helpful. Because then what you're doing is you can then have the major revision of, of the one and have that as your major. And every time you put out a new version of your PCB, for example, you can then cycle that one, two, three, four, and so on. The, the alpha then would be for any minor changes on your PCB design. Uh, for example, if you had a, if you pulled out a fabrication drawing and you say, oh, you know, we need to change this note here. Well, the note doesn't mean that you have to, what? You're not going to recreate your Gerber package, right? You're not going to create your whole design again. Well, that's a minor change. You're just doing a, a change on a document. Well, that would be where it changes then the alpha, where you have 1B, 1C, and so on. Then when you need to put out new Gerbers, that's when you would then cycle the 2 up to the 2A then again. So it's a really significant way of being able to control and manage your revisions. And understand, out of all those, remember that list I gave you of all the different items and different things in Concord Pro? They're not all going to have the same revisioning. So think about your revisions, whether they're going to be a singular or whether you could then use a major minor setup. So just understand that you can, you're, you, they're not going to be the same. But as you can see, uh, Right up here, we actually have several different revisioning schemes, like for our builds, for our components, our templates, different things like this. This is actually a screenshot of our, our uh, revisioning scheme, OK? So the use of me, uh, major and major minor uh, levels. So you can also then, in, in uh, Concord Pro, you're going to be able to ad adjust what content is attached to that revision level. So if you go up, if you pull open your page here and you go up the content type, it opens, these are all the content types of all the different items in Concord Pro. So you can actually open your revision scheme, go to con content type, and then you can say, yep, I want this, 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 and this, and that. You can, you can actually then dictate what your revision scheme is going to be for those items. So you can actually identify those. So let's talk about life cycle a little bit. This is your second level of management that you're going to have in your library. You, basically, this is for PCB design or 
or it, well, this, mostly here, this one here in particular is for uh, a component. So you can have a prototype level, an introduction, you then have your prime area of your component, then your, your end of life then as your component starts dying off. Understand this, guys. Every component will die off. There's a life cycle to every component. Otherwise, what? We'd all be still working with three through axial through hole uh, resistors, OK? <laughs> Which would be like, Ugh. Not everything will have the same life cycle. Just like the revisions, not everything will have the same life cycle. So this is where you have to kind of sit down and say, OK, these are the items we want, we're going to be managing. All right, the two big areas we're going to be covering today, your components and your projects. And then you can say, OK, these are my, this is my revisioning scheme, my life cycle scheme that I want to have for those two things, uh, or what other items you want in your design. So this here, for example, is a, a life cycle for a component or a project. You can actually go in and set up your, uh, your flow chart. And Concord Pro is fully able to handle all this and any life cycle scheme that you would need. Um, I would actually kind of tie this in to your PLM life cycle. Whatever PLM you're using, tie it into that life cycle also. Uh, don't try to reinvent the wheel, especially if you've already got an established PLM. If you've used Arena, how many of you guys use Arena? Okay, Agile, Windchill any of those, uh, just realize that you're, it's very difficult to kind of shift gears in that PLM. So kind of try to conform it to that and try to um, just follow that pattern that they've already established. Don't reinvent the wheel. So let's talk about roles a little bit. The third, the third level of your management is going to be your roles. Not everyone's going to have the same roles. And it used to be where you had your PCB, you had your double E, you had your mechanical engineer, and maybe your component, a librarian. Just a, just a point here. Um, out of those four areas, who do you think is most important? I'm going to put you on the spot here. Who do you think is most important on that, those four? Librarian, yep, absolutely, by far, the librarian. Huh? And the hardest to keep, because you know why? Because I, I don't think we appreciate them enough. All right? I love my librarian. He's great. I, I, he's my best friend. He, he's where everything starts. Right there. He's, he's where everything, every project starts, the li that librarian. And he is the key to all this working. But there, but there are now other roles involved here. There's third parties, there's manufacturing, there's procurement involving, there's quality and regulatory, there's management and product and financing, there's engineering management. There's all these people involved in the, the roles now. And I'll tell you what, I, it, when I first started at Legrand, they came to me and said, look, uh, we want everyone. We had at that time about, at that time we had about 20 people working in, as designers. We now have 50 designers at Legrand throughout the world. We have China, we've got Europe, we've got US, and those are our three main uh, areas that we work we have the PCB designers working, and I'm the senior, and I'm in charge of all of them. And I can tell you that they came to me and they said, you know what? We want everyone to be able to create components. Oh, no, no, no. No, thank, no, thank you. I, I'm not going to sign up for that one. Because why? Because you, you, the more people that you have involved as in a role, the harder it is to control especially your librarian. So we have now three librarians, just it. Those are three people that, I, that you can actually then focus on 
and teach and train and work with. 50 people, I, that's unmanageable. You can't control it. So here, you're actually able to set up permission levels to who can do what. So with your roles, we have librarian, for example. Where with a librarian, you can do different things. You can create your components. You can do this. So what we've done is we've set up levels of roles. Now, understand there's, there's different mentality. There's different ways that we tried this. Number one is we tried to set up a uh, person based on a role or a level. So if someone's a level one, they can do this, this, and this. If they're level two, then they can do this, this, and this. We've actually tried to work it both ways. Um, we found that the leveling seems to work a little better because then as the person moves up the level, as let's say we have our junior, we have a junior engineer who's just starting. Well, you, you are a level one. You can do this, this, and this. It controls what they can do. Then as you move up and let's say you're a, uh, an engineer or a senior engineer, then you move up the levels. Your permission levels and what you're allowed to do then go up also. But this is where this all happens. This is where uh, you basically then set up your, your permission of whether they can be added or edited or different things like that. So these are your four levels, four areas that you've got to be looking at when you're talking about managing your library. You're, you're going to be looking at your, you're going to be looking at your revisioning, your life cycle, your roles, and your permissions. Okay? <clears throat> so let's keep moving here. Um, architecture is A. Now, architecture is defined as a specific structure that governs what data will we collect, how it's stored, arranged, and used. It's vital because it's, you've got to be able to easily find your components you're needing. If you can't find what you're looking for, What's the point, right? And number two is you've got to accommodate that company growth that I talked about. OK? How many of you are familiar with this building? Beautiful building. If not, drive, tw by, drive five minutes up this road. All right? You probably passed it on your way in here today or whenever you came in. You probably passed this hotel right up here, Hotel Del Coronado. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful hotel. OK? Do you, you agree? But get, get the chance. Actually go in there. My, uh, I actually go in there every few months. I love this building. I love the history that's here. This is one of the first hotels that had electric lights. Thomas Edison actually set, a, set the hotel up with electrical lights, and it was one of the first ones. Uh, one of the trees out front was the first electric lit Christmas tree. And it's still sitting there. But it's a beautiful building. It used to be uh, the largest wooden structure in the United States. Okay, it's a, you got, I cannot tell you how beautiful this is. You've, you've been inside? Yeah. I cannot describe to you the beauty inside this hotel. It's beautiful inside. It's all wood. It's a wooden hotel. It used to be the largest wooden structure. Now, a little, little point of interest here, if you're ever in, in a trivial pursuit, this building was actually built with no architectural plans. None. Zip. OK? What they did was they piecemealed it together. All right? You can see that a little bit in this area up here. This is the front, the front, front entrance. You can actually see the piecemealing where they kind of like how they structured that. But it was all done with no architectural plans. Now, I would not advise you to do that with your library. OK? This turned out OK. It's a beautiful hotel. Please, I, I would highly recommend it, yeah. It's right up here, about 10 minutes. Octopart says that they have, Octopart says they now have 13,810,269 com electronic components in, their, li in their, their library. 
Okay? That's a lot of components. Okay? 13 million. It's all about eating the elephant. Anybody familiar with my work, writing, speaking, I always use this somewhere. And I, and I know some of you have been going, okay, when's you going to bring up the elephant? Okay, <laughs> no, there it is. How do you eat the elephant? One bite at a time, okay? You've got to structure this in a way where you're, you're, you, you're looking at it and you're structuring it in a way where you categorize your, your components you one bite at a time, okay? So what Octopart has done, and this is how we've done our library, okay, is you're, you've got a category and you have a family. Think of your components. All 13 million of those components fall into a category. And the very first step you've got to take is your category, understand your category of those components. So your connectors, your passives, your discretes, whatever those would be. Every, probably every site that I've seen breaks things down into category and family. DigiKey, when we first set up our library, we set ours based on, on DigiKey. They had a very good structure of a category. I'm going to show you our library structure here in a second. They had a very good category and family that you work from. Then if you look here, for example, under integrated circuits, you then have a family of components. Fortunately, what, what Concord Pro allows you to do is set up fo folders. All right, you can set up your main folder, you can set up subfolders, and you can set up any levels of folders that you would want. So what we've done is, for example, this is our library here. We've set up our category, uh, and what we did was we used numbers at the very beginning. So our 900 series are, are, is our integrated circuits. Then we then set up our family as 901. You don't need to do it that way. You could probably just leave the number off and just let it sort. Uh, we wanted a kind of a structure of a sorting. But then you can even go multiple levels down in, however you want to structure it, which is great. Remember, you want to be able to find something very easily. You don't want to spend a lot of time finding stuff and then allowing for growth. So what we found was this. As we had, we had new components coming online into our designs, we would check, OK, what category do they fall into? Well, they're, they're right here. OK, what family do they fall into? Oh, wait a minute. We don't have that family. You simply add it to the list, OK? It was that simple just to add a category and family as you brought in new, new parts. And then under each one of those then categories and families, then you have your components. So here, for example, is our category for our integrated circuits, um, all our numbers. That we, so what we've got structured now, and personally, and just between you, you, you and just between us, OK, <clears throat> is that we, we basically have set up, um, I think at last count, we have 150 or we have 25 categories of components. Yeah, it looks like 25, 26. We always have like a miscellaneous or special components, different things like that. Um, and we've got close to 125 families now. And they're all set up where you can see the category family. Now understand, Concord Pro allows you to search too. So if you know what family you're looking for, you simply type that in, it brings up the family. So very, very convenient. So underneath each one of these categories then is a folder for the models, for the 3D models, footprints, simulations, symbols. You have one, you have one of these under each one of these categories. Now, I, I think you might want to change that. I've, I've seen some libraries where they have a single model folder under their category. So under this would be a model folder. I, I'm kind of like bending towards that way better. Have all your models together, all your, all your schematic symbols together, everything in a single location. Um, this seems to be a little better. I, I think 
we were looking at more of a structure of a, of a that was, we, we actually went through many changes here, guys, when we developed this. Because we had, at the time, we had 5,000 components we had to bring in here. So we had to think, how we have 5,000 components, how do we organize these, how do we manage them, everything. So a lot of that was that we set this up. And once we set that up, it's kind of hard to change shift gears. So I would actually recommend kind of having a single model file rather than multiple. Yeah, it seems to be a little easier to manage. So the R stands for reviewable and reprodu reproducible. The one thing that you want to do is you want to make sure that you review uh, your, you want to make sure that you review your uh, data. Just because you got it in there, it's organized, you're, you're managing it, doesn't mean it's reviewed. Doesn't mean it's good. Doesn't mean it's qualified. There's a, a lighthouse off the, the coast of North Carolina in a very rugged area. And actually, there's three lighthouses in that area. And what, against what you might think, what you do is you don't go from lighthouse to lighthouse to lighthouse to get into the, the harbor. What you do is you actually line up all three lighthouses so that you see one light. And that way, you know that you're on the track. I, I was talking to someone recently about their libraries and talking to them. And they said, well, I asked them, so what do you think the state of your library is? And they go, well, you know, I, I believe it's OK. I believe it's all right. I said, but do you know it's all right? See, there's a difference, guys, between believing and knowing. If I told you that if you go up to a, a stove, a, a turned on stove, and you put your hand over the burner, OK, it's going to burn your hand. All right, at that point, you believe. Now, if you go over and if you put your hand over the stove and you burn your hand, you just went from what? Believing to knowing. All right? And part of the problem is with our libraries is that we work in the world of believing is we're OK until what? we get the call from the assembly people going, oh, by the way, you have a messed up footprint, right? Then forget it. It's too late. It's already out, it's already out there. So this is your process that you have to got to go through with every one of your components to review them, to make sure. And because you do have a revision cycle and a life cycle, what we do is we put in a life cycle of new, all right? And you can actually set up where you cannot use that component. We'll see that here in a second. But every component that we use is quarantined. It's new, in a new state. It has not been verified. Go into a new state, a life cycle. And we have to verify that then. We, and how do we do that? Well, actually what you're able to do also is in, in your life cycle, in your revisioning, <clears throat> I'm sorry, your your life cycle is you having a choice down there at the very bottom, allowed to be used in new designs. We don't, we don't do that. If you have a new component and a life cycle of new, we make sure that you cannot use that, that component in new designs. It has to be verified. So that means that when we have that selected, no component is put into a design that has not been verified and chosen. And it does not leave the building until it's been, until that changes. I know it's hardcore, huh? But it has to be that way. Because why? Because you got, you get, everything is going to be where it's, it's not controlled or managed, and then it's like ca total chaos. All right? So the very first form, the very first thing that we do, the very first um, review part is what? Our data sheet. Now, a little warning about data sheets. Uh, do not place full trust in an a, a unverified data sheet. <laughs> All right? But the data sheet said, yeah. Right? That has bit me so many times in the rear end. And you think, now what did I miss? 
if the data sheet and the component matches the footprint, yep, uh, yep, uh-huh, what did I miss? Well, it turns out the data sheet's wrong. And you call, the, and you call them and you go, oh, yeah, yeah, we knew that, yeah, yeah, we know that, uh, yeah. So when possible, have multiple sources for components. Compare the data sheets. Don't just trust one data sheet, guys. If you, can, if you have multiple sources of a component, pull every data sheet you can provide, cross-reference them, make sure that everything lines up. And when you have a bad data sheet, flag that vendor. May have an issue with the other components that they offer. All right, if they, if they, made a, if they may have an issue with one component, they may have issues with others. So that's your very first uh, line of defense there for a review, <clears throat> is understanding uh, your data sheet and understanding how to use that. It's your very first verification standard. The second is your IPC. How many of you guys are familiar with IPC? Okay, every one of us should be. There are beginning standards that we should be, everyone should have these on their desk. Every one of you, all right? IPC 2221, 22, 23, and 7351. As you can see, there's an entire family of other standards that are available. But you should be very familiar with, especially let's say <clears throat> 7351. That's your component, that's your surface mount component footprint uh, standard that you should be using, okay? Now understand that um, IPC constantly reviews things and they update it, all right? So this is why you should constantly keep in line with IPC and keep, keep a, abreast of what they're changing, what they're doing. They will change, IPCs will change their standard. For example, a big change they did from 7351B to C was they went over to rounded pads, all right? Because the, there's a, I think there is the less noise and less conflict. So the objective here is to recreate reproducibility. Really what we're, what we're trying to do here, we're trying to produce reproducibility to say, when I put that component down, it is verified and I know it's good. I, can, I, can, I don't have to lose any sleep tonight over believing or knowing or anything else, right? that I can sit there and I can say, yep, I'm absolutely positively sure <clears throat> that we are good with that component. So it's hard to get back trust when it's, it's been lost, guys. Okay? You, some of you know what I'm talking about. Let me give you an example. <coughs> Excuse me. Nine times one is nine, nine times two is 18, nine times three is 27, nine times four is 34, nine times five is 45, nine times six is 54, nine times seven is 63, nine times eight is 72, nine times nine is 81. What did you focus on? Which one? Nine times two, minus. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, did, I did not notice that. <laughs> okay. But nine times four, you focus on what's wrong, don't we? It's only not, it's, it's, I'm not coming down on you, but this, this isn't how we are. We focus on what's wrong, not what's right. And when you, when you screw up and when something goes awry, I can tell you that the managers are not going to be focusing on all the good things that you have done for the company in the last year. What are they going to focus on? Your mistake. They're going to focus on what is wrong. Okay? That's what you focus on, and that's what they'll focus on. You don't, you can, it's very hard to build back trust when you've lost it. Because what? Everybody keeps bringing up that one mistake that you made six months ago. Yeah, well, it didn't work that one time, you know, the long, long time ago, you know, you made that mistake, you know, and it's, how do we know it's right now? Okay, I've been there, I know. 
Okay? It's very difficult to build that trust. Okay? Not all of them was correct, but rather one that was the one that was wrong. The same is going to go for you. All right? So per, the last pillar that we're going to be looking at is this. Tailored or traceability. The review pillar and the traceability pillar are kind of pre-production and your traceability is post-production. Just because you have now got your board done and it's out doesn't mean it's correct. Okay? I have so many engineers that come to me and go, well, it worked. Okay. But that means that that may just mean that we just got lucky. All right? Just because something works doesn't mean it's correct. Get that. Just because something works doesn't mean it's correct. So the, the mentality many times is that once the board is gone and it's released, oh, we're done. There's nothing more for us to do. That's not the case. There's still several, there's still this pillar, this last pillar that you need to look at. And the other reason is it's there is that otherwise you would have SMAR, which has, I don't know what that is. I don't, I don't know what SMAR is. Okay, so, so an additional process reports. What you're going to be looking at here is you're going to be looking for reports, post-production reports that you can get now. There are design for manufacturing reports that you can get from the fabricator, assembly house reports, build findings reports that you can get from them of what issues they, they arose with them. Okay, I put a lot of, a lot of trust and lot of, I put more faith in the assembly build finding report than I do DFMs a lot of times. Uh, PCB fabrication reports. Uh, all these are available. Now, field service failures. This is one area that I, I constantly get reports back from field service people of what fa what's failing in the field, okay? A lot of times, something may not fail for a year, but then we'll start seeing a pattern of, um, of failures. And a lot of times, what you're going to be needing here is you're going to, this requires a root cause analysis. This takes a little bit of work here to, to look at a problem and what data that you have to work with and looking at your root cause and working it backwards. And a very good reason, a very good way of doing root cause is this, is that you can look at the five whys, okay? This is a process that you can go through to get to the root cause of an issue. For example, I come out and my car's not starting. Why is my car not starting? I have a dead battery, okay? Uh, why is my battery dead? My battery is dead because my belt is broken to my alternator. Why is my belt broken? My belt is broken because I did not replace it in 10 or 100,000 miles. Okay? Why, is my, why did my belt break? Because I, didn't, because I did not take care of my service maintenance the way I should. All right? That's getting to the root cause. You have to go back to the root cause, guys. You don't work with your cosmetics. Don't work with the fact that, okay, I'm going to replace the battery. That's not going to solve the issue. You've got to dig deeper into your root cause and determine what caused all this. And a good way of doing that is to go through the five whys. So what we're just going to see here in the, in the upcoming presentations is this. The pillars are going to support everything above it. Your pillars are going to support your components, and then your components are going to support your project, your PCB projects. All right? So questions? No one? Another question. Yes. Yes. So, by verifying, what do you mean? 
Um, that was the review. So what we do is we actually have a board of people. We have three people that will go through the data sheet. They will pull up, the, pull up that component. They will then go through that data sheet and they will verify the footprint. They will verify the models that they used. Um, see the, the models, the footprint, the symbol, everything that, that's a part of that. Yeah, right. So we actually compare that to the data sheet. We have multiple data sheets, then we compare those together and verify that the information is most recent. Then what we do is we change the life cycle of this component to new to released. Then it's now a released component. It's it's on the board. It may be put on a board. Yeah. Yeah, that may be the case. Uh, that after you do, and then, then you know it's correct. Right. Up until then, it's still a library component that hasn't been verified. You, you give it a, a different category after that? Well, what we do is we make sure that we do not release any components that have a new state. And you can actually look at your components that you're using and what the state of them are. And you can see, okay, this component and this component are brand new. We, after release, yeah. you can actually put it on the PCB, but you still don't know. Because you haven't actually built it. We haven't, we haven't actually. At some point, you have, you have built something yeah. with it. Yeah. Does it then transition from release to, I know this one's correct? Uh, released is a, a, a um, Released is our, our level that we put as a component that we've reviewed. So it is still possible to build a board with the release of board that is not correct? Yes, it could be. Yes. So it is, yeah. I like to put that other state in there. Yeah. I, I built at least one board with this, with this footprint, this data. Yeah. Well, that's where your tailoring process comes in. That's where your traceability comes in after your production is now you're looking at other issues. You're looking at the reports from your assembly house, your fab house, different places like that. And you're now getting that information back to you. And that you're, understand the design process is not a straight line. This whole process is not a straight line. It's a circle. It goes, it starts with your components. And as you're putting out your production and your, your PCB design, you're getting information and data back from your fab house, your assembly house, all these other places, field service, all these different things, and you're feeding that where? Back into your components. You're comparing that information and that data back to your components and saying, is there an issue in the component level here? I'll give you an example. We actually found that um, we had crowding on a board, okay? We had a situation where, I'm trying to remember the specifics, was that we, we actually had where tombstoning was happening in assembly process. So we were getting reports back from the assembly house that was saying, oh, we're getting a higher level of tombstoning in this area. Oh, okay. So when we looked at the component, we actually found, how many of you, how many of you guys are familiar with what's called the placement courtyard in a component? Okay, very important part of your component because it's a, it's a placement, it's a courtyard around your component that you should not violate, okay? It's a block uh, that you can then set your components and then those then is what you line up to, to the next component. When we looked at the design and we looked at we thought, okay, well, we, first off, we checked and we thought, okay, why are we getting tombstoning? Okay, we found that the components were crowded. Then we said, why are the components crowded? Well, it was, we thought, well, maybe they violated the, maybe they violated the placement courtyards and they overlapped them, all right? Well, no, they didn't. Well, it turned out the problem was all the way back to the component level that the placement courtyards were not correct. They were actually following the, what the placement courtyard was, but 
the placement courtyards were not correct. So we had to then adjust and expand out that placement courtyard to allow for better placement of the component. So that's a good example of how we took the data at the very end of our process our from the assembly house and brought it all the way back into our component and we found out, okay, our problem is with this component. So yes, you, even though you verify and you, you have multiple eyes sometimes looking at it, you still can go wrong on that. So just keep that in mind. Question? Yeah. Yeah. Who has the handheld mic? Ah, there it is. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I have another question. Yes. Life cycle is end of life. Yeah. Yeah. Now, in Concord, it will flag that. Yes, it will. It will flag that. But also, I would, I would. Get that in the life information from because you know I usually find out about it. You know, I built the component three years ago. Uh, oh yeah. And it just fine. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you know, the next run of war. Surprise. Surprise. <laughs> you know, if it's a passive, a cap, or a resistor, right. it's pretty, pretty easy to find a replacement. Babe. Yeah, question for both of you. Do either one of you use Active Bomb? I, I do. Okay. Active Bomb would actually catch that. All right, if you take your components, put it in Active Bomb, they will tell you what it does is it goes out to Octopart, looks at the 13 million vendor or 13 million components, and the vendor, all the vendors that provide that, and they bring back a report in Active Bomb. And you'll, you'll hear more about Active Bomb throughout this week. And it can, then it says, this component's not recommended for new designs, or it's end of yeah, life. Sometimes, I mean, I've, I've got an issue with that, because sometimes it comes back and tells me, this component is not recommended for uh, new designs. Yeah. You go to the manufacturer page uh, website, mm -hmm. perfectly fine. You know, and what it, according mm -hmm. to the Octopart guys, is, you know, they haven't gotten updated information, or they don't have information that they consider to be reliable yeah. So they flag it as not, not recommended for new designs, but the manufacturer always supports it. Well, I've seen that. Yeah. I, I think what it is, it's not a single manufacturer or a single component or a vendor. What they're doing is they're looking at multiple vendors, they're looking at stock supplies, they're looking at a, a complete different algorithm to calculate whether something's coming to the end of life. Um, I've actually seen it where... Yeah. This one is okay. I, right. You know, I'll vouch for that. Yeah. I, I've had the situation, though, that I, I flagged it. It came up flagged as end of life, where I saw the same situation where I would go to the vendor and, I, okay, where, where are they getting this, right? Where, same. Yeah, and, and there's no traceability. And then. The where did you get that information that you're telling me? Yeah. But then also then six months later, bam, it, it hit. I mean, so we've seen that almost consistently now. I guess so. I, I really do. I, 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 I'm, I'm totally amazed at what Ultium can do. But yeah, that's, I think they're seeing the future. That's what it is. Well, you hate to make those manual entries because there's no, you know, they, they, you forget about them. And then two years later, yeah. Right. Right. So I mean, I've I just had that situation this week, when I, I we we put a, a MCU a microcontroller on a board, and it came up and it got flagged. All right, um, it's saying not recommended for new designs. Okay. So I gave that to the engineer. He goes, Oh no no, there's there's three thousand of them at DigiKey. Okay. All right. You know, we're going to run with it. We'll see. All right. I, I sort of, I, I put, what? 
I put a lot of trust in DigiKey. I put, I, don't know, I put a lot of trust in Altium and trust in especially Active Bomb now. I, I run it a lot constantly. I run my bombs all through Active Bomb. And it tells me. Now a good a good source, another how many of you guys use item manager? One person. Wow. Okay, so there is a tool in your schematic that you can actually, it's called item, under tools, it's called item manager. And we're actually going to see that in the component area. That you can verify your design, your schematic, and what components you're using. And it will tell you the state, the revision of all your components, whether they're out of date with your library, all that. I mean, it's one of those tools that I constantly use. And one of the tools that I constantly test our, our designers with. It's called Active, it's, no, it's called Item Manager, okay? And that's a tool that we constantly use um, to run our schematics through, yes. That is in your schematic under Tools, Item Manager, okay? It syncs, it makes sure that your schematic is synced up with your library. Ah, not yes. External data right. So this is. The, the actual component I put on the schematic sheet. Right. Matches the current version that's in the library. Yes. In case somebody's updated. The library. It's the library. Constant, keep, keep in mind, the library is a very fluid, it's always going to be changing. It's going to be constantly updated. All right? There's going to be changes that happen. So, we take our schematic, we run it into Active Man or, uh, Item Manager, and we verify everything is up to date. Also, in, con in, in your PCB, your schematic, you'll, you'll be able to see that if you click on a component, you'll see that it's out of date, that you can update your component from there also. Constantly keep your components updated and make sure that they are, are synced up with your library. That's a major part of the whole PCB process is a coherence, a, a syncing up of your data. Remember what a process is. It's where you take an input and make an output. That output becomes the input for the next part. That output becomes the, the input for the next part. Well, the, what you need is you need something that you can make sure that you're synced up with your library, and that, that's item manager. It's a very helpful tool. Yeah. There you go. These are the rules that you have to set up, guys. There are these are hard, fast rules. All right. And I think you had brought up the question about it's difficult, though, right? Earlier, it's difficult. I've had a lot of conversations when I run item manager. One of the things is that it identifies, it identifies your rogue libraries. It, said, it tells you where your, your, that component, the source of that component is. And if I come up and I see Joey's library sitting there on my list, guess who I'm going to be talking to? I'm going to be talking to the designer and saying, where did you get that library from? Get rid of it, or I get rid of you. Okay, because what is we? You cannot go back to where you were. If once you get this managed, once you set up your libraries and get this managed, and start getting it under control, don't lose control again. <clears throat> don't lose it. Okay. Question. So, uh, when you, uh, got rid of all the yeah. <laughs> it, um, was it a sobbing or was it just a little weepy or no? <laughs> At that time we had one librarian. We had one librarian working in the library, single library. Okay. And everybody else could use the data that was there, but they couldn't change it. That had to be the librarian. The librarian was the key, the gatekeeper, we'll call them. Yeah. Were they, um, were the other designers able to, or they just, like, like, they were pretty much cut off from it? 
They were cut off. Yeah, we cut them off. Yeah, I mean, it is very... It did at first. It did at first. Um, and what we did was we added an additional librarian who then handled the workload, different things like that. So it did it, it did at times and at the very beginning. But it's, it's a system that once you've set up, it works very, very, very well. Because in, all, in Concord Pro, you're able to give over, and we're, we'll see this in the next session, <clears throat> that you're able to give over component request just through, through Concord Pro, you're able to do that. Um, and those go over to the librarian. It's very easily handled. Um, it's not like it used to be, guys, with creating components. You'll see that in the next module. It's, it's, it's not minutes. I mean, we're creating 1,000-pin VGAs now in like 10 seconds with schematic symbol, 3D model, footprint, all the source data, everything. In like Yeah. Now, no representation for the logic that you're going to put into that. Sure. FPGA. Yeah. So, you know, I usually got that one you can build in 10 seconds. Yeah. But then there's the one that goes for this project. Okay, yeah. I divided that FPGA up. Right. The logical part. And, you know, the, the barrel log and stuff is going to go behind that. Yeah. And I want that on my schematic because that's the logical flow. The PCB is okay for the footprint. Yeah. Right. But the logical part of, you know, the engineer, the next engineer is going to look at that schematic and try to figure out what I, what I was thinking about. Well, you were thinking, yeah. You know, this is how I divided that SPGA. Well, that one, take, that, that one takes a little bit more work. Um, that's why your librarian is so important. I mean, I, I... I wouldn't even trust him to get it right. Yeah. I want to do that. I, okay. I want, to, I want to make those changes to that symbol so that I know what I use that for. Mm-hmm. I'm going to get what I want. I don't yeah. Want yeah. Okay. So this is this is one of the examples of like how you got to to kind of massage this information and and kind of fit it into your situation. So um, kind of stand, take a step back, eat the elephant, and think. Okay, now how how can we organize this? But yes. Yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So there's different ways you can do. Yeah. Right. Right. Whatever works for your company best. I mean, like I said, there's no hard set rule regarding this. There's endless ways that you can do this. So, um, and what I presented is just one example that we used. Yeah. Okay. Right. <clears throat> okay. All right. That would be a question I would have to take to the Altium <clears throat> sales group. <clears throat> Thank you. No. It, yeah. Right. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, I think they are, yeah. We we have three we have three license types in our in Legrand, 
We have full licenses that are global. Then we have SE licenses, which are schematics, and then viewer licenses. So some people are going to go in. They're just going to pull a viewer license. They don't want to change anything or do anything. They just want to view something. They'll use a viewer license. Then anyone working on schematics are, are required to use the SE license, and then the full licenses are for, for PCB designs. So um, yes, there are levels, and those are different prices. So, but that, that was a more of a uh, accounting question than, no, that, that's fine. I'm, yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of curious on exactly the, how they bill all this myself, but we have a total of 28 licenses that we use and they're global licenses. Anyone around the world can use those licenses. They've also stand, I think the cheapest way is like standalone licenses that you have only your local system. That's also another way of doing it. Okay, question. Any other questions? Yeah. Question. Yep. What about unsupported PLM systems? We're going to be talking about PLM and com components next session. And um, I think what we're doing is they're, they're expanding out more PLM systems. All the PLM, all the, uh, all the PLM integration is done through an XML file. So they are constantly bringing in new uh, support for other PLM systems. And then the other one, the big one, is how do you migrate from the PC vault mm -hmm. to the software pro? Okay. There's a integration that you can do to integrate your library over. Um, you could actually use that. Um, I would be very careful doing that, though, uh, without... Um, a, it, without verifying the information that you're you're pushing in, okay. Well, we have an existing vault that has seventeen thousand components. All right. That are all verified. All right. Know that they're good. There, there's an integrator, isn't there? So then you, so I believe that person using the ultra vault three point zero. Correct. Yeah. Well, what, one thing that you can do, though, and this is what the process we went through, was that when we actually went in stages. We, uh, we had a, a system, and we did our PLM integration probably a, two or three years later, was that we, we create complete sandbox environment um, that we were a, a separate 
server for the sandbox. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. What I would do is I, we could get with some developers. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Let's let's see what we can get some developers to put their heads together, because I I'm sure they can. Put it to you know solve this issue, you know. Sorry, uh, what's up? Tesla. Which was Tesla up, up in what Palo Alto? Palo Alto. Okay, I know they just created a did an office in Carlsbad. Yeah, that's through an acquisition. Yeah. A lot of a lot of our engineers are interested in stepping over there, so. Guys, thank you. Uh, one, one more question? Yeah. I'm sorry? Yeah. Well, a lot of times what we do is we'll go into Octopart, we'll pull up the part number that we're looking for, and they'll say there, this is your category and family. So then we know the connection. Hmm? Okay, so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm not even sure yet what, what category I'm looking for. All right. But I know, you know, you're All right. Kind of after a while, you kind of say a, a diode. So you're looking at a semiconductor, and you, you start learning the library of, you know, where things are uh, and what category or what, uh, where a component would fall. And you kind of get familiar with that. Um, there are some sometimes a little idiosyncrasies regarding whether uh, whether this component's a semiconductor or, or IC or different things like that. But if you, there's, are you familiar with manufacturer part search um, in Altium? Okay, very, very good tool, guys. They just came out with this. It was a manufacturing part search and component search. You can actually search all the manufacturing part searches, uh, tap into that 13 million components of Octopart by filtering uh, what you're looking for. Um, by category, uh, let's say resistor, then you can filter by, by your parameters, what you're looking for. So we're actually gonna be going through that of a manufacturer part search and component search, very, very big areas. Um, I see in the future, guys, that we may not have our own local libraries. I mean, I mean, it's getting to the point now where you can actually go into the manufacturer parts search and lay a component down directly from there. There you go. What's that? I trust that librarian. I don't even know his name. Yeah. You know, he's got a city built that far, right? Because everybody makes a mistake. I mean, yeah. I, just like you, I've gotten bored back in the. But I can tell you. I, I, I'm very familiar with uh, the fact that people build parts um, and some of those are, that's why you go through your own review process. This doesn't remove the, that review pillar. You have to still have that, all right? Every time you, just because you pulled a part down from the manufacturing parts search, don't just put it down and trust it fully. Um, don't trust anything, all right? But trust but verify, that's how what I, trust, okay. trust but verify, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yep. 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 
Well, thank you very much, guys. Uh, I'm going to get with you, and we'll talk more about that. The Hoyer. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you for your attention. It's been great.